Here we go! You're listening to Theological Discussions with Christian Anarchists. Well, I've got nothing better to do. He did not just say that. One man, one mic, plenty of scripture, and absolutely no filter for truth. He's a five-point Calvinist who affirms theistic evolution. He reeks of being hellbound. This guy shares more videos of James White than James White. He's just another stupid Bible-thumping Matt Slick wannabe. The views expressed on this show are solely those of the host and do not in its entirety express the views of the volunteering members of Spiritually Honest Ministries. Enjoy the podcast or get ready to send your hate comments. Beginning broadcast in 3, 2, 1. What is up? What is up? What is up? This is the Christian Anarchist, and this is theological discussion. It is. What is it is Thursday, March thirtieth. A very good day for everybody to be doing their thing. Me, I'm just going to be here doing my show. But we got a guest on, uh, someone who goes by the name of Lord Jesse. That at least that's concerning the uh, the uh, username. Ended up wanting to have a conversation on here. We are going to be discussing the issue that I personally don't understand why the conversation is going to happen for this subject is who is the Alpha and Omega that is mentioned in Revelations chapter 1, verse 8, which says, I am the Alpha, in IV, by the way, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come the almighty so uh the tradi- the some of those who aren't familiar with it the traditional view is that it's focusing on that this is jesus because it is if we understand the king james this is in the red letters that this is the words uh that whenever they're in red these are usually attributed to jesus um so we're going to go into it because he thinks it is specifically addressing the father god the father where i think that not only could it just be to jesus but that even then i could say that it's a pl- that's possible that it's just talking about god in general and that therefore it applies to all three distinct persons of the godhead in the trinity But we're going to carry on the conversation and see how long that takes us before we decide to uh, close out the show. So, uh, Jesse, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks for having me. I uh, promoted you a little bit last night on the Hank Hill channel. The Hank Hill channel? He does some hangouts. Hmm. I've never heard of the guy, but all right, that's cool. All right, so... So what is your uh, issue with the specific interpretation of the people that, you know, people are saying that it's uh, Jesus, but where do you think it's something else? Well, I know I'm going to sound crazy. Okay. But I think that King James, the Bible has been altered. I think maybe, uh, maybe it was the father speaking because I, I, I believe that Jesus looks exactly like the Father, but I think he's a you know a separate being, a separate entity. So you're saying Jesus looks like the Father? Well, like I said, I'm going to send a little cuckoo. Okay, but, but if he looks like the Father, in what way does he look like it? Well, um, I, I believe that the father cloned himself. Okay, where is that in the scripture? Well, it's not in there. Okay, so glad we got that cleared. Okay, so then if that's the case, then what up then, if he cloned himself, where does it say that God, the father had a physical image? Well, like I said, I'm not an expert, but I think in Hebrew chapter one, verse eight, 
and I don't have the Bible with me. I don't know if you have it. I have it right in front of me and on my computer, on my software. Does that say anything about he's the exact representation of the Father? Well, let's take a look at it. I'm sorry. Hebrews 1, verse 8. But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. So, yeah, I think it's... Um, are you in Hebrews chapter 1? Chapter 1, yes. I think it's a, a scripture before that, verse 8, maybe, where it says that Jesus is the exact you know, like a replica of the Father. I'm trying to see, but I don't see that. Because the verse before verse 8 was, and the, of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. So... Yeah, maybe maybe the Jehovah's Witnesses changed it on me because that, that's what I was, and and I read well, the scriptures. Well, well, this was a King James, so yeah. But um, let's just go into the verse. So we, so the verse which is Revelations one eight, uh, will say that, and I agree that you know it could just simply be referring to the Father there. But I think if we go to the last chapter, which is Revelation chapter twenty two. There is what is known as the epilogue of the passage, starting from verse 12 to the very last verse. Um, and we see that someone is speaking. Um, so let's go to Revelation 21 or 22 in the King James. I'm going to use the software for this so that way I don't have to just turn pages on this one. So it says here, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright morning star and the spirit and the bride say, come and let him that hear us say, come and let him that is a thirst come and whosoever will let him take the water of life freely, meaning without cost for testify unto every man. They may have gotten the verse wrong. I, let me check something real quickly. I thought it was going to be okay. Yeah, verse twelve. So I went up. I went too far. Okay. Yeah. So verse twelve says, "And behold, I come quickly." Uh, note that in the very first verse of this passage, it's talking about an angel appears, um, and is starting to say these things. So that's who is being addressed here. Is this specific angel? Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the last, beginning the first and the last. So we see this phrase again. But the next thing we know is that then verse 16, which continues this pattern of the speaking, says, I, referring to the person who is in speaking, Jesus, uses the word Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. And then says, I am the root offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So we see that verse 13 uses I am Alpha and Omega, but then says, I, Jesus, have sent mine angel. So even if you don't hold to the view that this is uh, the truth, just simply you can refer to all in the members, it can. we do know that it still refers to Jesus based upon this passage. I mean, what say you about that? Well, I found that scripture here in, in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. It says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of His being, sustaining all things by His powerful word. All right, what verse is that? Uh, verse 3 in the Hebrews chapter 1. Okay, now before we go into that, did you listen to what I say? Yes. Nan, what are your thoughts on that verse? Well, you said that Jesus sent his angel? It says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel. And it's in the same context of the speaking in which the earlier verse says, I am the Alpha and Omega. 
Yeah, because, you know, I feel like the Bible has been altered. Okay, you can say that, but that then which translation is therefore reliable? Well, that's the problem. I don't think none of them are reliable. Then do you are you a Christian? No. You're not. Then what are you? I'm, I'm a Maltheist. What's a Maltheist? I, I believe God is cruel. So you believe God is cruel and you reject the God of the Bible yet. So, so then why? I mean, I don't no, know. I don't, I don't, I don't reject him. I know he exists. I just don't condone the way he does business. Well, then you got a problem there. A big one. Yeah, because the God of the book, because in the Psalms and all them, people are able to see God is good in his statutes. But you, if you, uh, person that claims that he is cruel and all that, I mean, then I don't know what to tell you. It obviously shows how you weren't able to discern that certain point there, and you're coming up with some of these ideas that God is able to clone himself. Well, um, uh, Alpha and Omega to me, maybe I'm a little weird, means that you're the last one going to live. You're the last one that's going to die, which basically means you're not going to die. Well, then why is there the then the Alpha? Well, I think that's the Father. He's, you know. The Alpha, but then Jesus then uses the same thing to say Alpha and Omega, that he is both Alpha and Omega. He doesn't just identify as the Omega. Okay, mate. Maybe I misunderstood the word Alpha and Omega. Yeah, the reason now the reason why he uses the word the Alpha and the Omega is because of what's next. I am the first and the last. Alpha is the very first uh, letter in the Greek alphabet, and then Omega is the last word in the Greek alphabet. So he uses that expression to help correlate that he is the first and the last, meaning that he is the one and only. So it's referring to his uniqueness in one of a kind state at that point. Like I said, maybe I understood the meaning of Alpha and Omega wrong, mm -hmm. but he's he's not the Almighty. He's not the Father. He's um, he's the meaning me. He's the say hello to my little friend. He's he's not the he's not the top dog. And in uh, my opinion, Jesus will one day cease to exist. Okay. Well, just so you know, that is not an accurate interpretation or a proper exegesis of the particular uh, text concerning who is God at this point. I mean, I was very confused whenever you brought the whole subject up because I thought based on the last hangout we were in, I thought you were a, a Christian or something, and I guess I was misinformed on that bizarre specific uh, issue. So Yeah, I, I try to, you know, I try to come on here and be peaceful and try to give people, you know, a, an exercise for their okay. brain. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes I can't speak about all my beliefs. Right, because... The, the... The very, when you say that they're referring to the Father, I mean, I'm just, if you just read verse 13 and 16 in chapter 22 of Revelation, it's very clearly defined that either it's talking about Jesus or it or the part that's mentioned in Revelation 1 a simply refers to the concept of the whole triune Godhead in general. Because what we're focusing on here is that Jesus identifies himself as this Alpha and Omega in verse 16. Well, you know, I feel like the Father is not really going to come to the earth. Like, it, Jesus is the one, you know, that's going to, you know, come to the earth. Right. And, you know, There's I don't know how to say this. The, 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 the Father doesn't get his hands dirty. He sends his, 
No, his son Jesus to do everything. So then what about the Old Testament? Was that Jesus? That's a good question. Because people well, say that Jesus didn't come until the New Testament. Well, the question can simply be answered that God the Father directly controls what happens and he appoints certain people, uh, not just saying using Jesus. He uses prophets to declare his message. He has used the nation of Israel to uh, win wars against uh, the enemies of God. And all on and all, all on, we see this uh, happen. In fact, even God has used wicked rulers to uh, punish uh, his people when they are in disobedience, such as God using King Nebuchadnezzar uh, when the city had been in uh, rebellion and turned to idols. So God sent King Nebuchadnezzar to put them into uh, bondage, and when they turn to God, then comes the next prophet, which is Daniel, who uh, helps slowly liberate the people from their uh, bondage. I don't know if if what you believe is the sin against the Holy Spirit. Is the what? Um, in, in your beliefs, what's the sin against the Holy Spirit? What do you mean, what's the sin against the Holy Spirit? Well, in my opinion, it means when you sin against the Father, when you sin against His Holy Spirit, when you sin against... Not when you sin against... The Father, and the Holy, the Father and the Holy Spirit are t two different persons in the Godhead. Because people, if you deny your maker, that's a sin against the Holy Spirit. How, so can you identify that anywhere in the text? Well, that's just my opinion, but like, well, they, well, they go, well, well there you go. The thing is that your opinions aren't coming from the scriptures. And if you're going to, so, I mean, you can make all those assertions, but that's nowhere in the text. And if that's the case, then I mean I can just say anything I want doesn't mean it's true. I could say there is a invisible pink unicorn in your house doesn't mean that's going to be true. There's got to be some indication that leads me to it. And likewise, concerning any claims about the Bible, I'm going to have to examine the text. Just like if you were to say if you were to write an essay, and I would that was on um, why chocolate is good, and I would to find some, and I was just to say something that. Well, somewhere in your text, it indicates that um, black people are inferior. Well, if your whole essay is focused on chocolate, why would that even be brought up in the first place? And if you, in order to prove me wrong, you'd have to show that your case in the, in the story that you wrote or in the article or the essay you wrote doesn't correlate to anything that I've claimed about you being racist or that you've made some statement about black people. So I would ask that if you, if you're gonna if you agree with me on this, that you would be you know as defensive on that issue. If I made an accusation against you on that, that you'd be likewise consistent concerning treating the Bible and the claims of God in that case. Otherwise, then why even just go to the Bible? Why not just then focus on what the Quran says or what the Book of Mormon says or any of those other texts? Because it seems to just be a focus on the Bible at this point. Well, I don't believe that, that God talks to him in the third person. Well, that God doesn't talk to to who in the third person? To himself. I don't think the Holy Spirit is a person. I think it's his magic or power. The Holy Spirit is a distinct personhood of the Godhead, of the God being. And so concerning what the holy spirit is we know about the holy spirit it is mentioned in john chapter 14 it is the great comforter that's going to come after christ but the holy spirit was also present in dur during the baptism of jesus and has been present in other instances where the father the son and the holy spirit are interacting with each other in cer at certain events but the holy spirit's main purpose is to overcome the believer that's basically it whenever we are filled with the holy spirit then begins the process of regeneration and we are made new creatures that is the biblical understanding of how the holy spirit works especially concerning the believers to convict the person of truth 
to begin the process of regeneration so that the person is born again and so on and so on yeah i look at the holy spirit like that when we star wars to me it's just a, a force right well so that's your opinion but that's not the biblical idea well I, i've met many christians out there that well, don't believe that it's a and which, uh, which you ones? Know, person like which ones well there's a lot of them out there if they don't believe that he is a person within the godhead because the thing is i'm not i don't care i don't think he's a human being not, not that person I'm referring to personhood as in the difference between a what and a who. For example, I am a human being. Who am I? Well, I'm the who is not a human, but the who is my name and my identity and the personality of which consists and makes me, which is Christian anarchist. I am a human being and the personhood that represents me and makes me unique and distinct from other humans is Christian anarchists. So, then likewise concerning God, with him already being unique as he is, he's the one, the one, the one and only God, then we see that he is expressed within three persons, meaning the three who's. That is the, fa the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Each have their own distinct role within the Godhead. Yes, I've, I've heard your, your argument before, but there's some Christians out there that, that don't believe in the, in the Trinity. Well, then they're not Christians. Yes. Christians like you. They're just not Christians. I mean, the traditional and biblical understanding has always been Trinitarianism. That's how it's always been. You can go back, not just the Bible, you can always go back to early church fathers concerning the idea of the Trinity. You can go back to earliest Clement of Rome, you can go all the way over to Ignatius, to Tertullian. Go all the way I, over there to the early history. There is no... I, I don't want to offend your beliefs, but in my opinion, my worldview mm -hmm. is that the, the church first century church was corrupted by trinitarians do you have any historical evidence to back that claim no i just read that it says that okay well there you go wolves in sheep's clothing will take it over right but that but you're asserting that you don't have any evidence no this is just my worldview right it's your worldview but at the same time my, the difference between our worldviews is that i don't just simply take it off of just blind Un, and unnatural uh, assertions to go to the claims that I am making concerning the issue about who my God is and how he operates and how the early church operated. I mean, you, you don't even have to be religious to understand how the early church operates and concerning how the doctrines and all evolved in the church. I mean, I have uh, Philip Schaff's eight volume church history book. I have uh, another church history book on my shelf and I can access many more of the early church writings on my computer with my software. I don't see anywhere where we are going to get what you're claiming that it was corrupted in the first century. Now, the popular claim is that it was developed during the Council of Nicaea during that century, which was fourth century, by the way, but concerning first, second and third century, we have plenty of people who affirmed the doctrine of Trinitarianism long before then. Well, I think that that believing in three gods thing is, is it goes it's back not to three Babylon. gods. Babylonian. It's, it's not it's not believing in three gods. Yeah, I heard you say you're each distinct person in the Godhead, meaning that it is the one, it is one God expressed in three persons. Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, I personally think that nobody could explain Jesus correctly. The Trinity we identify is a myth is a mystery and understanding. However, we do have the components and the basic understanding of it. As far as going to explain it to a full detail, we do not have that kind of capacity. However, we can show a basic understanding. So, 
you had to explain why that when in I believe it's uh, John's gospel when ever doubting Thomas has his doubts about uh, Jesus's uh, resurrection that he's uh, back from the dead and after he puts his finger in the hole in the holes that were pierced uh, to check to see if this was still the flesh and the body of Jesus he then get, he then says uh, my Lord and my God addressing Jesus as Kurios and his, and as his God so and those are terms that are only entitled uh, to uh, as we've seen in the Old Testament as well as the new uh, God you know he is Lord so then why is the same t name entitled for uh, God in the Old Testament at least in terms of the Septuagint uh, being applied to Jesus here I don't know if you believe in the thousand year reign of the Christ the thousand years that will come in the future yes do you believe he would actually rule the earth here in the you know like you know how I'm in the flesh you think he'll rule people like me for a thousand years I think he will be a ruler uh, for us yes as far as I understand of it as far as any other interpretations of that they could come later I'm open to what other uh, meanings of that text are but as far as I'm concerned that's how I understand it at the moment since it is focusing on the imagery of him as as a as a ruler a monarch especially showing how he will uh, return uh, is used very much with the imagery of how the uh, the Roman leaders uh, would come into battle would return from battle and shows uh, this sorts of sense of idea that uh, Jesus is this true king and is, bitter, and is different than the earthly kings especially in the context of what the original uh, audience understood which was that the, you know they were they were owned by the Roman Empire and that was the only kings they were familiar with so they had to use imagery that works for their understanding and of course one of it was the idea that Jesus returns um, almost like a uh, like a Roman king returning from battle, so just to simply point out that he is going to return like a king. Okay, every time I ask Christians this, do, do you admit that Jesus is going to hurt people to start his rule? Whenever he comes to earth? Does that include children? When he comes to, I'm asking the question, I'm asking the question because I don't understand what you mean. Will he hurt people? Well, I don't think he's coming back like where we're going to see him. He's going to be invisible. He's going to be a spirit. Well, then, well, that's your case. That's your view. You know, we're going to see him in the clouds. and he, He's going to uh -huh. avenge his, his death. He's not going to avenge his death. I mean, he went to the cross out of his own will. He took, he died there willingly and for a reason. Because in the, in the Revelation, it says that at the end of the thousand years, the devil's going to be let loose to test mankind again. Yeah. And he's going to take, a you know, many like the, like the sands of the sea. Yeah, he's going to let the devil do his deal. You know, I just wanted to say that, you know, Jesus is not that nice guy that everybody paints him to be. I, don't, like, I never claimed that he was simply just a nice hipster with uh, handing out milk and cookies either. I mean, he's taught some things that, I mean, he's the guy who talks about hell the most in the New Testament and all that. And he pretty much uh, got some whip ready and then started chasing people out of a synagogue that was treating it as a marketplace. So as far as concerning just simply being a nice guy it depends on the person yeah because i don't believe in a literal hell i believe that i'm going to return back to the ground oh there you go that's that's your belief we, we don't agree on much <laughs> well obviously i mean we, you're not even a christian But 
there's some people out there that are Christians and non-Christians that would admit to some of the things. I mean, they would agree with some of the things I say. Well, some of the things, yeah. But as far as concerning the issues that we're trying to talk about, such as who the Alpha and Omega is, I mean, that's what got the whole thing started is because I thought you were a Christian claiming that. No, I don't think uh, there's Christians out there that claim that, that Jesus is not the Alpha and Omega. Okay, well then, that because that's what threw me off, because I've been dealing with a lot of interesting uh, view-holding people on here. So that's where I would have assumed such. Otherwise, I don't know why I'm interesting to people like you concerning that um, issue. No, well, I, uh, I, I try to uh, interact with everybody. I interacted with G-Man. He, he cut me off after two minutes, and I, well, I interacted G-Man. with a lot of people. Well, that's G-Man for you. So, I don't know what... The, the, what I'm trying to do is, go ahead. The, it's just that the conversation, uh, we've already kind of addressed the issue that was supposed to be um, talked about, except the only thing is that according to your own worldview, that's what it is, but you can't, you know, objectively prove and biblically prove some of the things that you're claiming about the particular issue. Well, you know, I just wanted to promote that, you know, God is not a hippie. He's not a piece of love. And he, well, of he course killed, not. He killed the dinosaurs before we were even here. Okay. And... Well, I just want, you know, I'm an anti-theist. That means I'm, I hate organized religion. So I'm trying to get people to think. And Well, pe- people, know, in, people in religion are also free thinkers. So just thought you'd know that as well. Yes, I, I, I met a lot of smart people out there, very bright. Well, you just made the claim that people in organized religion are no, not free thinkers, that you're trying to get them to think. Well, because they, they believe in some some fairy tale stuff. Well, how do you know it's a fairy tale? Because every time I, I try to talk to them about it, they won't talk about it. They, they, they try to censor it. Yes, yeah, but at the same time, Am I talking to you? Yeah, yeah, because you're 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 one of those Christians that get on YouTube, and you're not afraid of you know Mm -hmm. speaking your your beliefs. Right, because I've actually studied some of the things some people haven't, and that's why they don't discuss those issues. And that's and that's actually a fair thing because unless you have knowledge on something, you don't uh, simply just discuss it. That's why for some people who are even just atheists or Muslims or any of these others, they won't discuss something if they feel the issue is either too personal or if they don't have enough uh, knowledge on a particular subject to go about it. For example, it was an atheist that was discussing things with an, uh, a guy who's protesting an abortion clinic. He ends up, uh, she ends up saying one of the verses where uh, it says, the happiest one is the one who uh, dashes his uh, dashes the little ones or the babies with stones. And the guy who was a pastor and has studied the Bible starts going into what the verse means, and then she just uh, forgets about it and says, "Okay, well, you know, I don't have too much knowledge on that subject, so you know, I'll, I'll give I'll give you that." So these people that don't want to then discuss and go or get into the issue, you know, that's them that just don't understand or haven't studied the issue. So, concerning what you believe, we can have a back and forth, but if you're just going to simply say, well, that's just my opinion or that's just my worldview, we're not getting anywhere. It's just simply us uh, agreeing to disagreeing, and then there's going to be an awkward silence afterwards. Well, you just did me a favor. You just opened a can of worms. You just said that in the Bible it said 
that happy is he who dashes your little ones against the rocks. Yes, and then I explain that the guy explains there's a context to it. It's not talking about saying it's a good thing to do this. But do you understand how many Christians out there never thought, never heard of that scripture? Some people haven't, no. But then some people who actually have studied their Bibles do. That's the ones who I'm trying to reach. If you go to Isaiah chapter 13, verse 16, it says, loot a man's home, kill his children, and rape his wife. So if you're trying to reach to the people who don't have any knowledge on this stuff, you're basically just looking for easy targets. Well, they're all easy targets. Even people like me? No, you've done your homework. Yeah, so you said, but you said all of them are easy targets, that, which includes me. Well, in my experience. No, you're, you're, you're kind of, you're, you're doing pretty good. You're defecting everything I say. You're mm -hmm. like a superhero. Well, it's just simply uh, having a knowledge of the scripture. So, I don't know, you want to be a superhero if you want to call it that anyways. You just got to study the word of God, my friend. Have you ever heard the scripture in Leviticus chapter 26, verse 29, where it says that you shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters? Leviticus 26, 29. Yes. I think it's, you know, it's kind of relating to the book of Lamentations where the Jewish people, it was prophesied that they were just going to, you know, go haywire. You will eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters. This is categorized under the punishment of disobedience. But if you will not listen to me, starting at verse 14, but if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and arbor my laws and fail to carry out my commands and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. You will plant seed in vain because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even when no one is pursuing you. So he's going into all these things saying it then in verse 21, if you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, when he's trying to give him the chance, I will multiply your affliction seven times over as your sins deserve. I will send wild animals against you, and they will rob you of your children, destroy your cattle and make you so few. Verse 27, if in spite of this you still do not listen to me, but then continue to be hostile toward me, then in my anger I will be hostile toward you. So we still see all this stuff, all this stuff going on. And it's only in sense of rebellion towards the covenant, uh, towards God, towards his people, which is the Israelites. So that is what is going on in that context. Yeah, I don't want to scare people because, I mean, that, that, that was the Israelites. That was God's chosen people, chosen mm -hmm. race. I'm not going to say that that's going to happen again or anything like that. Mm -hmm. So you can. So why mention that verse? Did you think that that was a command for people to do that? No, it's just that um, I try to share that with Christians, and they say you're crazy, you're nuts. Mm -hmm. You know why are you reading right. that? Be because you know? they're like because they're laymen. Just like there are uh, apparently some atheists out there who, um, and I've seen, and I've actually got a chance to be friends with a couple of them that you know are just average lay people. And, you know, they don't believe in a God of any sort. But they think the idea of evolution is a stupid idea and that it's unscientific. So, you know, you have all these kinds of people going into their own deal, but they basically just have asked, okay, well, then how did everything get about? I don't know. And I don't care. So these are just average lay people who are still in the sense of ignorance and laziness and do not want to tackle on certain issues. Likewise for some Christians. If they don't want to tackle these issues, then that's fine, that's them. And you can't change or convince them of that. So the best thing you want to do is engage with people like me and others who have actually taken the time to research and study these cases so that way we can work on, you know, whatever arguments you're trying to present to suggest that 
that the God of the Bible is cruel, which is only seeming to be cruel to you, though when you ask another person, doesn't seem to be. So do you think morality is objective or subjective? Noah, can you rephrase like the, the words on that question? Do you believe that right and wrong is something that you yourself can just determine? Or do you believe there is a standard of right and wrong that we appeal to? No, I think God put his laws in our heart, but... Okay, um, so then by, if that's the case, then by what... So what standard are you judging to say that God then is um, this evil guy? Well, I'm trying to lay off of him recently, and uh, I think he... he well, has... isn't, isn't that kind of like, you know, what, we're say, what you were saying, if some people you tried to ask about these, they kind of uh, hide and go away from the question? Well, that's because I, I, I personally think there's a lot of uh, imposters out there. Mm-hmm. A lot of people admit that. They say just because you're, you claim to be Christian doesn't mean you are. Correct. But I think God... Uh, he, he's allowed to do all these things, you know, and lives and stuff. And I ask Christians that, and they, they won't admit it. Oh, God is a giver of life. He loves the children. Well, he does love the children. That's what the Bible says. In fact, if you look in the New Testament, Jesus says that whoever offends, which the Greek word skandalizio means, to entice one to sin, if someone entices a children or a child to sin, then he uses the idiom of saying it'd be best if that person was uh, hanged with a millstone around his neck into the sea and drowned. So he uses some very strong language and then of course says, do not deny the little children to come to me. So Jesus, who is God, is very welcoming of allowing the kids or the little ones to you know be open to the message of who God is and to accept the message. Yeah, I'm sure he was nice to the children at that moment, but he was also comparing them to his cult followers, who they're like children; they just do whatever he says. Yeah, well, that's one of the things that is also mentioned. However, the same kind of faith can be said about anything. I mean, if you want to actually do something, you can examine something all you want. But in order for it to test if it's actually going to happen, you've got to do it. Have you ever heard the story about um, Jephthah? Who is Jephthah? I think it's uh, Judges chapter 11, verses 30 through 39. Judges 11, chapter 30 through 39. Oh, I've, already been through, uh, I've already been through Judges, so... Yeah, Judges see. chapter 11. Okay. And it tells a story it. about a guy that vowed that if, if he wins a battle, that supposedly he'll sacrifice someone to his God. And then it says that God gave him the battle, which I think it just means that he won the battle. But he was crediting it to God. And then he, he, he burnt his daughter, a virgin, as a burnt offering. He, he gave her up as a sacrifice to God. He killed her. No, well, it does not say that. Where? Well, you're like the Jehovah's Witnesses. They're in denial about that scripture. Well, no, the, the matter of problem is, where does it say that he burnt her? What's in the first scripture? It says something about where? her offering. Where? I'm not sure. Let me go look at it. But I don't know if you want to read the whole passage. You can go to the whole passage if you want. No, you, you could do it for me. I mean, or do you want me to read it? or If you want. You're the one that's making the statement right now. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses, they told me that it it means Jehovah's that... Jehovah's Witnesses aren't Christians, just so to let you know. Well, you just believe something, the same thing they say. Well, yeah, well, so there are several pagan gods out there. We believe in a god. Does that mean that then we're all the same at that point? No, it doesn't. We believe in different things. Well, they some are... in the world... Go ahead. Sorry. Go ahead. Now, what was that? No, I was just saying some in the world believe that this this is a literal he killed his daughter. Well then they're and they're wrong. Because it doesn't say that in the text. Well, I'll read it here. It says 
Go ahead. And Jephthah made a vow to the Lord. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return and triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's. I will sacrifice it, sacrifice it as a burnt offering. Then Jephthah went over to the fight the Ammonites, and the Lord gave them into his hands. He devastated 20 towns from error to the vicinity of Minith, as far as Abel, Karamim, thus Israel subdued Ammon. When Jephthah returned to his home in Mizpah, who should come out to meet him but his daughter, dancing to the sound of timbrels? She was an only child, except for her he had neither son nor daughter. When he saw her, he tore his clothes and cried, Oh no, my daughter, you have brought me down and I am devastated. I have made a vow to the Lord that I cannot break. My father, she replied, you have given your word to the Lord, do to me just as you promised. Now that the Lord has avenged you of your enemies, the Ammonites, but grant me this one request, she said. Give me two months to roam the hills and weep with my friends, because I will never marry. You may go, he said, and he let her go for two months. She and her friends went into the hills and wept, because she would never marry. After the two months, she returned to her father, and he did to her as he had vowed, and she was a virgin. From this comes the Israelite tradition. I don't know, to me, every time I read that, it sounds to me like a sad story, but you say that he, she did not die. Yeah, because why was she mourning for not being able to marry, specifically, if not just because she's going to die? She died a virgin. She died a, a single woman. I mean, she never got to experience life. She, because she never got to experience a single life. Okay. Concerning the passage, the first thing we have to keep in mind is that, one, the human sacrifice was something the Lord opposed. So that's the first thing. I mean, you see this in, this is before Judges, Leviticus chapter 20, verse 1 through 5, that there's a punishment for sacrificing children. So there was no way God would simply just allow that to happen when it comes later that it's, a, that it's a, the person's daughter. So concerning that, if we focus on the fact that it's not concerning to be able to marry, the one thing that it was considered somewhat of a sacrifice that was more of a spiritual sacrifice is offering the person to the tabernacle, meaning that this person would be given into the temple to serve their life to God. Uh, this happened to Samuel when he was born, that he was given an offer to the tabernacle to be raised as a prophet. So then you read about this during Samuel's uh, life in the first few chapters of 1 Samuel. So concerning that, even then that's considered a legit, yet not literal sacrifice concerning the issue. So even then he did make an offering to her, to God. He offered his daughter to be in the tabernacle. And one of the keys why we go based upon, because I will never marry, is because if you were a Christian, or not Christian, Jewish woman in the tabernacle serving there, then you are not allowed to marry. You had to remain a virgin. And I think the same thing applied as well with people like uh, Samuel as well, as if you had to keep this purity. Well, I'm not saying that God accepted, you know, that child sacrifice or whatever, I, I, in my opinion, it is. I'm not saying he accepted it, but he didn't stop it. Well, he, he, he obviously did. Why before? Well, I know he stopped I, Isaac. Not just, not just Isaac. Leviticus chapter 20, verses 1 through 5. Do you want me to read it? Well, I know he doesn't take delight in, in children being sacrificed to Baal. Not just that, because, but if someone did it, there would be a punishment against them. Did, did Jephthah get punished or have any tragic downfalls later on? See, I've never heard this side of the story before. Well, it, well, that's the thing. If Leviticus 20, 
verses 1 through 5 state that there will be a punishment, which let's read it. The Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, any Israelite or any foreigner residing in Israel who sacrifices any of his children to Moloch is to be put to death. The members of the community are to stone him. I myself will set my face against him and will cut him off from the people for sacrificing his children to Moloch. He has defiled my sanctuary and profaned my holy name. If the members of my community close their eyes when that man sacrifices one of his children to Moloch, and if they fail to put him to death, I myself will set my face against him and his family and will cut them off from their people together with all who follow him in prostituting themselves to Moloch. The idea of child sacrifice is explicit concerning the issue of Moloch. So that would be the only person in which they'll be. Because and then, of course, you have in Genesis that concerning the issue of Abraham and Isaac, that he is not going to allow the issue of human sacrifice. That was God's words after he told uh, Abraham to not uh, sacrifice his son, to not sacrifice Isaac. Yeah, I think that's talking about Molech, though. I don't think. Yeah, that, that, that in Leviticus it is. That, still, I don't think a, get it but still, the context is that Molech was the one god that focuses on that particular issue on on sacrifice. But as I said earlier, if you were listening concerning the issue of Abraham and Isaac. If you look to where it talks about Abraham's testing, let's go here. Starting at verse 15, the angel of the Lord called to Abraham from heaven a second time and said, I swear by myself, declares the Lord, that because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you and make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky. And as the sand on the seashore, your descendants will take possession of the cities of his enemies. And throughout the nations, yeah. And then Abraham returned to servants and they set off together. So let me see, that says second time. All right. It says, do not lay a hand on the boy. This is verse 12. Do not do anything to him. Now I know that you have feared God because you have not withheld me from your son, your only son. Abraham looked up and there in a thicket he saw a ram caught by its horns. He went over and took the ram and sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide, and this day it is on the mountain the Lord it will be provided. So if a sacrifice was needed, and he was told to do that, then why then would the let would the ram uh, be a sufficient offering? Well, some people are shaking their their brains just thinking about why does it need an animal? You know, why does he have to sacrifice? Because the animal was provided by God. That's the reason why it was there in the first place. Well, nowadays, people love pets. They won't sacrifice their pets to God. Mm -hmm. And the reason why is because we're not under the law. Yeah, but that, that's why people don't, don't try to, they don't trust God. Because, I mean, why would you have to be under a law of sacrificing your pets? Because this was a law that was given to a covenant specifically toward the Israelites. And we as Gentiles, as Christians, are not under the law. Christ was the end of the law. Paul says that we are not under the law. And so onward, the early church has always established, especially from Jesus, that Christians are no longer under the Mosaic law. Yeah, I, I, I'm 100% with you there, but do you, do you celebrate the Sabbath? Because I know some Christians do. I don't specifically observe the Sabbath. I observe the Lord's Day on Sunday. No, I don't know too much about that. I know they do the Easter thing. The, uh, th the, the Lord's Day basically means Sunday. That's the day of worship for the Christians, which Acts chapter 20 uh, says is when the Christians would gather together to break bread and listen to the sermons you know you've been very very uh knowledgeable well I, like i said i study I, I study the scriptures i wish there was more people like you that would uh make me feel you know like i'm not all high and mighty <laughs> mm -hmm. well that's why we have other people out there that are going about evangelism then we have people that are going about teaching apologetics and in fact that's the thing with christian universities is that now they're starting to engage in apologetics and in an emphasis 
on a Bible study, a, a, a person could claim to be a Christian, but the person who goes to church, they're most likely going to have more knowledge on this stuff because they're actually uh, engaged and interested in the word and want to hear it preached and want to hear it exegeted. And then they'll go home and examine these things for themselves. Well, I think the atheist is a religion. It's a, it's a cult following. But the group that I do respect is the apatheist. They don't care if there's a God or not. They're, they're not interested. Yeah, I've, I've met a couple of apatheists, but he, uh, and I actually know a, uh, a couple of them either. But the concern the Sabbath, where are we going with that? No, I was just going to say that Christians, they don't go by the that anymore. They don't. Right, because we're not obligated to. Yeah, because a lot of people, they try to bring back those those old covenant rules and stuff. Right, and of course, if we look in the uh, Council of Jerusalem in Acts 15, uh, one of the people trying to say that we needed to be circumcised to be Christians, that was a heresy that was condemned. Likewise, other Judaism heres Judaizized, blah, Judaizers heresies were condemned at church councils. And this heresy was eventually just gotten rid of throughout the first or second century of early Christianity. Because if I say something about the Sabbath right now, there's some Christians out there that will chew my head off. Right, and that is why they aren't, they aren't really Christians. If they're going to have a big issue with this, then they don't follow Paul concerning the issue where it says, in second in Colossians chapter two verses sixteen, let no man therefore judge you in meat or in drink or in respect of any holiday, holiday or of the new moon, or of the Sabbath days. Verse seventeen says, which are a shadow of things to come, but the body is of Christ. Meaning that these things are fulfilled in Christ. You mind if I read a couple of scriptures just so that. You know, people are like, well, this guy, Jesse, he, he's all he's doing is just reading the old thing, the old. Well, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. Let me let me read some stuff here. But uh, I got to type it in here on Bible Gateway. and It's a lot of trouble here. Cause I don't have backspace on my little thing here. Well, that's why I would recommend getting you the word software. Let me read. Yeah, this is weird here. I didn't type it correctly. Here. We didn't find any results for Second Thessalonians. I'm gonna give you a link to check out. It's a. Uh... No, I'll find it. It's I know. Just, uh... but, it's just, but this is for later. This is more easier than just simply using Bible Gateway. It's a software you can download to uh, not just read the Bible, but also get some studying materials to help you with it, such as commentary and Hebrew and Greek lexicons and all that. I mean, I don't want to sound like the bad guy here that all I didn't accuse you of being one look sometimes they, people say that I you know all I'm doing is just spreading hate or something well it doesn't seem oh, like I, that to me they have different they have different different Bibles here I don't yeah. have to go only with with the NIV yeah there's King James Holman Christian Standard Bible Geneva ESV I mean, there's all kinds of different translations that you can get, the, the Net Bible, all that. Oh, here we go. Um, it says here, in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, starting in verse 5, it says, and God will use this persecution to show his justice and to make you worthy of his kingdom for which you are suffering. In his justice, he will pay back those who persecute, persecute you. And this is the, the part that some people don't want to hear. Which verse? In verse 7, in Second Thessalonians chapter 1, it says, And God will provide rest for you who are being persecuted. And also for us, when the Lord Jesus appears from heaven, he will come with his mighty angels in flaming fire, bringing judgment on those who do not know God 
and on those who refuse to obey the good news of our Lord Jesus. They will be punished with eternal destruction, forever separated from the Lord and from His glorious power. When He comes on that day, He will receive glory from His holy people. Well, what I'm trying to say is that He's going to destroy people. It says it right there, eternal destruction. Mm -hmm. I don't see that as being hell or, or you know, because if What's you go to mean? hell, that means you get you get to live forever. So let's examine the text because this is coming right as soon as Paul uh, is. And plus, he's also addressing Silas and Timothy are also being the people who is writing this uh, epistle and is writing it to the church at Thessalonians. Starting in verse three, we ought to we ought to always thank to thank God for you, brothers and sisters, and rightly so, because your faith is growing more and more. The love all you have for one for one another is increasing. Therefore, among God's church, we boast about your perseverance and faith in all the persecutions and trials uh, that you are enduring. <clears throat> all this is evidence that God's judgment is right. As a result, you will be counted worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are suffering. God is just. He will pay you back trouble to those who troubled you. So he's referring to because they are saints who per have endured and continued to believe regardless of persecutions that they will get their reward when they go to heaven, when they go to the kingdom. And give relief to you who are troubled and to us well. So then concerning that, the Lord revealed this will happen when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven in blazing fire with his powerful angels. So let's get there. This is where we're starting to get to. So Christ is not, so I'm reading the NIV study Bible, so we're going to go from there. So Christ is now hidden, and many people even deny his existence, but at his second coming, he will be seen by everyone for who he is. Then concerning the blazing fire, he comes to punish wickedness. And you can see this in Revelation 19.12, Isaiah 65.15, Revelation 1.14. His powerful angels, perhaps a class of angels, such as a group mentioned in the apocalyptic writings, given special power to do God's will. See Revelation 19.14 and note. So let's go then. Who will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus? They will be punished with everlasting destruction. All right, let's go there. Verse 9, destruction. Since salvation implies resurrection of the body, annihilation cannot be in mind here. If you want to see otherwise, see 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 3. And the note there. The word means something like complete ruin. Uh, see Matthew 7, verse 13, and the note there. Here it means being shut out from Christ's presence. The, this eternal separation is the penalty of sin and the essence of hell. See Revelation 20, verse 14 through 15. Also Revelation 21, verse 8 and verse 27. Okay. And so, and shut out from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. On the day he comes to be glorified in his holy people and to be marveled at among all those who have believed. So believers are considered here. This includes you because you believe our testimony to you. So this is basically Paul, Silas, and Timothy trying to assure the church uh, that the Thessalonians are a part of, that they will be saved because of their steadfast uh, perseverance in their belief that they believe and that they will continue believing regardless of the persecutions that have come among them. So Paul, Silas, and Timothy is giving them a grant and a uh, guarantee, basically, because of what's going on. And he says, then, for those who do not believe, that they will be punished with everlasting destruction, which, as we say, and if you want, we can go into the passages that it mentions that this is simply referring to, in course, from First Thessalonians five three, and the other verses. It's just simply the simply uh, the eternal separation that is mentioned. Yeah, um, like I said, I don't want to sound like the bad guy, but I think that Islam is sugar coated to Americans, and also Christianity is sugar coated to Americans. Like, Maybe I understand I that for Islam, but I don't see how for Christianity. 
Well, many unless you're talking about the prosperity gospel preachers. Many people believe that Christianity, you know, that you know, if you're a Christian, you know how it says, um, "God will the vengeance belongs to God." Yes, and God will repay. Well, in my opinion, when Christians, the body of Christ or the bite of Christ, when they get to heaven, they're going to be warriors also. They're going to be takers of life. Well, says who? Well, in my opinion, I mean, they're going to join Jesus okay, well, with his go. mighty well, angels. Well, that's the thing. Your opinion, but it's never anything of what the Bible teaches. Well, it's common sense. They're not just going to be sitting there watching. I mean, they're going to they're going to be they're warriors going, too. They're going to be there, and they're going to be uh, worshiping God and then and revering and being with Him. That's what they're doing. Yeah, let me read the scripture that I have here in um, Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. The nations were filled with wrath, but now the time of your wrath has come. It is time to judge the dead and reward your servants, the prophets, as well as your holy people, and all who fear your name, yeah. from the least to the greatest. Yeah. And then the, this is the part that is disgusting. It is time to destroy all who have caused destruction on the earth. Why is that disgusting? Well, I mean, you know, I'm not, I just, what I don't like how that? God does his, his, his violence. I don't like the way he does violence. Yeah, yet you get your, you say you get your morality from him. Why, why can't he just take the spirit of the, the life force out of people? Why does he have to go out there and, like, shed blood? Because God can do what he wants. He's God. Yeah, I, I realize that, but, jeez, that's crazy stuff. Well, people, people can say, say the that, about every other th issue. People say that I'm the insane one when he's the one doing all those bad things. He's the one that's... He, people should say God is insane. Let me ask you something. Um, do you have children? No, no, my conscience won't let me bring children into this world. Okay, then. So if there was a time when you believe your conscience will allow you to bring children into this world, and your child misbehaves and won't listen to you, how do you plan to deal with the solution if the person keep, if, the, if your child keeps misbehaving? Well, Hank Hill told me the same thing. He told yeah. me that you gotta get, yell at them and spank them so they'll remember. Yet, at the same time, people will say, well, that's uh, cruel and that's mean. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, advocates for children out there. Yeah, so then if that's the case, then why do you get to say that they're wrong in their criticism of you, but yet that you're right in your criticism of God in that case? Yeah, it's none of my business. You know, I'm just, a, I'm just a, the clay. Uh, you know, he's the potter. Okay. So you can't ultimately say that what he's doing is disgusting or immoral, but rather that it's, in your opinion, that is the case. But you can't say that that thing is right or wrong, objectively, based upon what you're telling me. Well, I've never, I've never heard you say it, but there's other Christians out there that told me, what's wrong with killing babies? And uh, yeah. obviously because not only is it a sin, but that is definitely very proof evidence that if we desire to even do such a thing with murdering children, then definitely the person has not the spirit of God in them, and that is not a godly thing to do. No, no, they're talking about that God's allowed to kill children. Okay. They said, what's wrong with murdering babies or with killing them? Yeah, what's yeah. Well, well, when God does it, he is not called murder. It's not called killing. Right, because when was the times that he did it? Well, he did it in the, in the flood. Right. And why were the children included there? Because they were the offspring of the fallen angels. They were... Uh, and they were also uh, going to be included in what was the judgment upon the entire uh, world at that point who believed, who was basically just sinful beings and had no sense of remorse or repentance. And that basically God was going to wipe out a wicked generation and that Noah and his family 
would be the only ones uh, spared for that reason, for that purpose, so that they that way the world can still continue onward. Well, in my opinion, he also killed children in Sodom and Gomorrah. And he most likely could have, yes, even then, because of their because of their sin and their unrepentant behavior and their hardened hearts. They would ne they will not turn to do good or righteousness, and therefore God would judge them. I, I just can't see a, a little baby having the, the mentality of of right and wrong. They don't have to. And that's why they and they end up getting punished due to in the because they're not only not only in the city, but because apparently the parent is keeping them there. And still allowing them to then be raised up into that uh, life, that now will happen. So they're there, and it's because the city is being destroyed, and it's the parents' fault for definitely bringing the kid there. But if a city is going to be judged, then it's going to be judged. God was going to allow someone to be spared. In fact, Abraham pleaded that if they would find five good people in Sodom, spare the whole city. The only good people was Lot, his daughters, and I can't really say too much about the mom because eventually she ends up looking back into the city, disobeying the angel, and she ends up getting turned into a pillar of salt as a result. Well, I'm not a follower of that doctrine about the rapture, but I speak to a lot of people that do believe in it, and they say that the kids are <laughs> going to get a pass. They're all going to... But the babies are gonna all go to heaven, and I'm so, uh, and I told them that's a lie. Well, why is, do you believe you don't even believe in the God of the Bible or any of that? Believe that you know you don't believe in any of the doctrines. You're not a Christian. Where is your biblical basis that the children won't automatically go to heaven? Like which children? Well, in my worldview, this is hell, and you have a better chance of winning the lottery than getting saved. Well, your worldview disagrees with the Bible, so, I mean, you're gonna make an assertion about what hell is. That's a that's a concept borrowed from the Bible. Oh, I know this is not the literal hell, because I don't believe in a hell, but this is a hell-like condition that people talk about. Okay. So, yeah, I don't know what I don't know what you're up to. I don't know what you're gonna do. Well, I honestly have no idea what we're going to have to discuss anymore. I mean, we've. I mean, uh, I, I I could get out of here and I could just hear you talk to the uh, other people if you want. I mean, I don't have to be in. Well, we're about to. I guess I can just take this off air and we'll just uh, for for this day's sake we'll do a uh, just an off air chat because some people are wanting to come in and so they're waiting on the. The link for that so i'm gonna oh i know i meant you i could get off of here and then they could join your link and then i could just listen you don't have to get off air if you don't that's, want to well, i've only set this up for me and you and that's what's oh yeah yeah it's be, not so. the the ask, ask yeah, the questions. Same, this, yeah. The same, yeah the same ask ca that's yeah. that's tomorrow um but yeah so yeah we're gonna get the link out soon uh, but before that happens uh I will just uh, close the show up in prayer and then we'll uh, be heading out. So, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for bringing uh, Jesse in here. We would ask that you be with him, that you may guide him, and that you show him your truth, your love, your grace, your mercy. He is interested in these discussions, and because of that, hopefully we both have learned some things. May, you, may your spirit be with him. May you grant him wisdom and that he may seek the truth that is in your word, that is in your grace and your love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus, who died on the cross for us. For if it weren't for him, we would never be able to be reconciled unto you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.